just another story of the same. We're back. We're back. We're hey, back. Fam. Hello, Baltimore. Hello, I, Kalila. I feel so far away from you. I know. Come home, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> We're like in a weird version of ET right now. Know, Ouch. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hi, Baltimore. Or we could be the Wonder Twins. Oh yeah. Unite. That's good. I like that. Better. I like that. Yeah, I like that better. R.I.P. Stanley. <laughs> Uh, R.I.P. Nick Breed, too, as we'll talk about later for a second. Um, many things have happened since we were last here. Yeah. We had an election here. We had many elections here, in what? fact. Yeah, I know. It's so weird. I just woke up one day and all of a sudden, well, the governor was the same. But <laughs> oh, hmm. um, Some exciting things, though. Baltimore is now the first major city to have banned water privatization. Totally. The so. state overwhelmingly passed a lockbox to make sure schools were getting money from the casinos instead of it being supplant instead of it supplanting money that schools already should have been getting. I think it was a 90 percent mm-hmm. margin. So pretty much everyone in the state said give the schools more money finally <laughs> as as should have been people can ago. know can now uh same register to register. vote that's right on the same day as the election so come on exercise in the franchise mm-hmm. very good lots of good things i had the most painless voting experience this year and i guess it's because so many people early voted yeah i had like there were three people ahead of me in line it was wild so at my location i did do early voting which i think i will never do again i like the energy of the totally tuesday voting um but there were lines all day for like three or four days at my station so when i went the line was almost out the door it moved quickly but it was good to see that's right Mm -hmm. yep um so here at the real news network we did a bunch of uh live coverage um you were there front and center, Kalila. A little uh, under the weather. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, had a little bit of a, a coughing fit. I'm glad to see you're feeling better, though. Thank you. But it was a good conversation. And, you know, I think we got into deeper analysis about uh, some of the progress- progressive candidates around the country and also what was happening here in Maryland and what was at stake, both between the um, pieces we reported on um and the panel we did the night of the election and the follow-up so lots of good stuff to take a look at that really isn't contingent on the election but thoughtful analysis about what policies would make sense for people yeah definitely check us out at therealnews.com and you can watch all of our coverage from throughout the campaign season and uh from the night of too yep um but our first for uh piece today is actually uh sort of a post-mortem look at what happened in the maryland election specifically uh mark steiner sat down with Really interesting group of um, panelists. He had Karen Hooper, who was the editor of City Paper, um, Koi Tangela, who's a sort of incredibly funny political satirist, yep. um, Lester Spence, who everyone knows is like a scholar, activist, uh, academic, uh, here in Baltimore, and uh, Larry Stafford from yep. Progressive Maryland. Yep. So let's take a look at that. As you know, we broadcast here from Maryland, in Baltimore, Maryland, and we're going to cover in this segment. The elections that took place in our own hometown and in our state. It was significant because a Republican governor who was seen as an anti-Trump factor in the Republican Party won re-election against Ben Jealous, the former president of the NAACP. That was significant. We'll talk a bit about that race. There were all kinds of ballot measures across uh, that really talk about the progressive push in the state of Maryland. What did they mean? And the push to change votes and people who get elected inside the legislature also took place. So we're going to cover all of that with our guests. One of our guests, let's start off introducing them all to you, Larry Stafford. He's the executive director of Progressive Maryland. Coley Tangela is a Baltimore-based political satirist, educator, and activist. And Karen Hooper is a journalist who's written for the Washington Post magazine, The Nation, Newsday, Mother Jones, Village Voice, Salon, and many other publications. Is also an educator. Dr. Lester Spence is an associate professor of political science and co-director of the Center for Africana Studies at Johns Hopkins University. His most recent book is Knocking the Hustle Against the Neoliberal Turn in Black Politics. And folks, welcome. Good to have you all with us. Thank Thank you. Glad to be here. So one quick question. Was anybody at this table shocked that Larry Hogan won re-election as governor of the state of Maryland? Upset, but not shocked. (laughs) Upset. Uh, No surprise. That's what the polls were indicating all along, unfortunately, but yeah. 
Lester? Uh, no surprise at all. <laughs> I mean, I was hoping against hope. Maybe I'm foolish. I was hoping because, you know, I mentioned to you earlier what I was saying about polls. You know, what can we learn about polls is that white people don't tell the truth on them. Yeah. And that's not right anymore. You know, and I was saying, no, I no, that that is true. That is true. You can no. go, you can go to Florida. You can look at Florida. You can even oh. look at Maryland, um, <laughs> even though they had Hogan ahead all the time. But in their in um, Jealous's advertising, I don't know who these white people were that were surrounding him. <laughs> Maybe good-natured white allies, but where were their where were their outreach to the white community to get them to vote for um, this black man, who I believe was the epitome of what we truly need. Some of you could come in, Mark, if you want to. Maybe he wasn't the best deliverer of that. So uh, let's just say no, no. But, <laughs> so, so the literature has been pretty clear, right? I mean, so you go back. When, when did we first find this out as political scientists? It was uh, somewhere in the 80s. It was either somebody running. Is Brad, was Bradley mayor of Los Angeles? Or, Los Angeles. Yeah, so the first time we find it is w in Los Angeles because Bradley's margin of victory was a lot smaller than what the Post predicted. And then we found out that the reason it was a lot smaller was because a lot of folk were lying on the, uh, I'm sorry, we're saying one thing and then doing another. Right. And then we actually see that trend, that uh, something like that trend. But, I mean, for, for three reasons, that trend doesn't exist to qu quite the same way anymore. One is because whites have actually gotten used to black folk running and actually winning. Uh, two is simultaneously, white folk have ki kind of gotten used to um, to, to telling the truth about racism <laughs> in their polls, right? So um, just for those, I mentioned three, third doesn't really matter. But yeah, so it, for that reason, I, it does exist, but it's not the same, it's not the same great thing. I know we're talking about Baltimore dynamics. Florida has a 14% black population and, um, and um, Gillum was black black. And he almost yeah. won. And he almost so, and he almost won. So it's it's not so much. So racism exists. It just doesn't quite hold that same shape anymore. That's so let's I'm, I'm, let's let's look at our state here. I mean, what does this election by Hogan mean? I mean, he ran clearly as the anti-Trump. He was when he ran for governor the first time. Uh, he made it clear he voted for his deceased father, who was a former congressman, uh, and and not for Trump uh, in the general election. Uh, he is seen by the larger population uh, in the state of Maryland, um, a, a large chunk of the black community and most of the white community in the state of Maryland as a person who is a solid middle class guy who is going to solve the problems of the state, can walk, walk across both aisles and do the things right. I mean, that's how he's perceived. And that's why he won. Well, I, I'd say this election to me means two things. Uh, Larry Hogan is like a living, breathing PR operation, just walking in front of our, our face in the governor's office every day. Uh, in, in his cabinet and throughout his administration, he's appointed communications professionals uh, throughout. So credit to them and their operation for being able to manipulate and deceive many Maryland voters about his real record. Uh, so to the other point of that, I think this election means that Money still matters in politics to outspend jealous by 13 million uh, to about $2 million, you know, plus additional outside spending that he had a disproportionate ability to send that manipulative and deceitful message. And then the, the last thing I, I'd say in terms of what this election means to me, I'm not going to let any of these Democrats off of the hook who frankly stabbed Ben Jealous in the back by either endorsing Larry Hogan or tacitly uh, supporting him and giving cues to their bases to vote for him as well. So I think I, that... I, I, I want to come to Jealous in a minute because I'm going to talk a bit about his Ben Jealous's campaign and, and what just happened here. But Karen, let me let you jump in here. Um, well, I mean, I think one of the uh, biggest issues is, again, is the money and that colors the whole campaign. And part of... Um, the advantage that Hogan had was the Republican Governors Association was 
dropping several million dollars, three million, to run these ads calling Ben Jealous a socialist. And all of this in the months leading up to um, October. So really, um, Ben Jealous wasn't able to even run any ads until really, really late in the game. And I think that really hurt him um, uh, money-wise. And I think that the um, Hogan wisely, perhaps, um, even though it's disingenuous, he wisely allowed the um, Republican Governors Association to play the bad guy, to um, you know run the negative ads, so that he could run the positive ones, emphasizing um, you know what a moderate he is, et cetera. Um, and people, you know, across the state. Um, uh, don't associate him with Trump. I think Ben Jealous and right. his campaign probably went to bed every night praying that Trump would endorse Hogan or come campaign for him. That never happened. So it was really hard for Ben Jealous to cast uh, Hogan as a you know, Trump ally. And I think um, had they been able to do that, that would have certainly helped. What did you make of... Um the assertion in this panel that part of the issue is that people, especially white people, were lying when they were uh, polled about how they were going to vote. Listen, you know, in the state of Maryland, um, our Democrats are um, pretty conservative, mm -hmm. right? And they're closer to the middle than they are um, towards progressive policy. Very much. So I think there are assumptions about the misnomer of blue state, right? Like that really comes from mainstream media, the concept of blue state, red state. Mm -hmm. You have a population of people who, uh, frankly, based on the way they vote locally and, and the things that they oppose in the state legislature, um, are readily unwilling to enact policies that support whether it be black liberation, eradication of poverty, access to transportation and jobs, and quality schools being accessible for all students. Yeah. And so that can only happen in a state that has most people registered as Democrats if many of those Democrats are not voting for the interests of the people who need, who need the most supports from you know, the social fra fabric. Um, so I, I, I totally believe in yeah, that. I believe it too. Mm -hmm. um, and we did see um, you know, mostly in races that were in no way close um, or with folks who were running unopposed. But we do see some new blood in the Democratic Party from this election season. And I think that that could usher in um, maybe a little bit more room for uh, at least, uh, you know, grassroots groups, grassroots groups to work more with the Senate and the House to um, usher in some new policies. But uh, well, I think that what it also sh also showed was for the Democratic Party, the establishment that thinks that they if they don't support local candidates and state level candidates that they cannot get elected and we saw yeah. that is not the case so i think ben jealous was an anomaly to the extent that the democratic party didn't really support him because he's not so much from the state oh, right. <laughs> so you know he didn't have his own reputation to build on you know it'd be different if he had his own reputation and then um the party didn't support him because it's like you know forget the party we saw that in multiple races Truly. especially here in baltimore um but he didn't have that and I, I think seeing it with the state level races of a number of senators uh should be a call it may not be but it should be a call to folk that people are pushing towards the left and perhaps that if they had a platform that people could articulate um, from the left that the party would be stronger for sure and that you know, the party needs to be there and help articulate that um, yeah. and not just expect the left to come into them, but for, for the Democratic Party and the, you know, establishment wing of the Democratic Party to make concessions to that more progressive wing and the mm -hmm. new um, incoming wing. I mean, I think since 2016 and probably, <coughs> excuse me, probably a little bit before that, you see both nationally and locally the Democratic Party in some ways pandering to the middle yeah. and, you know, I think that's a part of why people responded to Trump is because he's kind of like, this is my position and that's it, 100%. right? And so not to say that it is necessary for the party to go extremely left. I mean, I think there are some policies that need to be fleshed out on the left um, totally. that, are, that are supposed to be progressive. Um, but there is not a platform people can articulate that is like, these are the values of the party. Agreed. And so when people call them corporate Dems, you know, there's not really a rebuttal for that because where do you get your money from? What policies are you really driving home and explaining to people um, will support them living their best lives? 
It so. also leaves so much room for a centrist Republican like Hogan to come in and just, you know, steal the show very early on because if you don't articulate something that's so different from what uh, and again, a centrist uh, mm-hmm. Republican is articulating, then how are you really differentiating yourself at the polls? Why would somebody listen to... Some- like, if your entire platform is just vote for the Democrats because vote for the Democrats, then, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you're not probably going to have a very strong ground game. Um, you know, <coughs> I think what we may see is a movement by the center. Um, there are mm, close to 700,000 um, unaffiliated Marylanders who who participate in politics 700,000 yep so I think we may see some kind of ballot initiative or charter amendment or something that will open the primaries up Um, I think the Democrats assume that it can't happen but I think everybody needs a voice in this state in order to get the type of policies that we say we believe in agreed so Um, this next piece from Jessel Noor actually I think kind of explores the same concepts that we're looking at here um you know it it looks at why this blue wave didn't really come in maryland the way that some were i guess predicting it would um and he also here talks to some new people who we were talking about some new people who are going to be taking um positions of uh elected officials now positions of elected officials some new people who are going to be coming into the party now all right let's take a look in this deep blue state in this blue year with a blue wave, it turns out I can surf, and we had a purple surfboard. The Democrats' blue wave fell short in the Maryland's governor's race, where Larry Hogan was reelected by a 14-point margin. Hundreds of thousands of Democrats reaffirmed the wisdom of John F. Kennedy, who said, sometimes party loyalty demands too much. Hogan spent heavily on polling and carefully avoided divisive issues. And to all those Democrats and independents who crossed over and cast their votes for me. I see some of them out there tonight. He carefully rhetorically distanced himself from President Donald Trump and even embraced some liberal causes. Let me assure you that I will continue to be a governor for all Marylanders. The day after the election, Hogan blamed Trump for the defeat of Republican efforts to end Democrats' veto-proof majority in the state Senate and the defeat of many down-ballot candidates backed by Hogan. Uh, we had uh, President Trump say the election should be about him, even though he's not on the ballot. And in Maryland, that's exactly what happened. Uh, it was a repudiation of the president who lost this uh, state by 30 points. Democratic nominee, former NAACP CEO Ben Jealous, beat the establishment pick in the primary and ran on a progressive platform. The pundits nationally will talk about how we could have made history tonight. But I want all of you to understand that we've already made history by proving that you can win the Democratic nomination for governor in Maryland without taking a dime from a corporation. Jealous's campaign was out fundraised by a wide margin and lacked the slick look of the well-oiled Hogan machine. And he wasn't backed by his own party in a meaningful way. But the positions he embraced were backed by a majority of Maryland voters, poll showed. Jealous argued his campaign pushed Hogan to the left. When we started this campaign, The governor intended to bring fracking to our state. And we beat that back too. When when we started this campaign, they laughed at the idea of free community college. And it's already begun to appear in our state. Hogan's campaign took credit for passing legislation he once opposed, like family sick leave, or that was passed by Democrats, like the education lockbox for casino proceeds. Jealous supporter and Baltimore councilman Chris Burnett says Hogan was a master at controlling the narrative. But he's really good at shifting the blame. And so I'll I'll say, you know, when it comes to schools, he's continued to shift the blame to central office. When it comes to violence, he shifts the blame to to the mayor and and the city council. Uh, And not that we don't bear any responsibility. Of course we do. I mean, I'm working hard every day in my district, and I know my colleagues are, to to make our city safer. But at the end of the day, we can do more with more resources. I mean, our, our schools are vastly underfunded. They have been for the last four years. Another challenge Jealous faced was a lack of enthusiasm for Democrats that had had a history of failing to deliver on campaign promises. For example, Baltimore's Democratic mayor campaigned on a $15 minimum wage but vetoed the legislation once in office. The reality is, if, if we all do better, we all do better. And when people can afford their rent, when they can afford to eat, when they can afford to go back to school and, and better themselves, we all win. 
2018 wasn't a wash for Maryland progressives. In the primary, Mary Washington pulled off a stunning upset of a longtime incumbent state senator. That's in part why I really connected with Ben Jollis' campaign. Um, he was coming from the outside, coming from a person that didn't have the support of the establishment. Hogan ran on lowering taxes and reducing regulations, while the Republican Governors Association poured millions into attack ads against Jealous, saying his platform would bankrupt the state. Washington says progressives need to do more to win over moderate voters. I think that means that our party and those of us who identify as progressive or who want to make sure that we have quality health care, that we want public education that's well funded, that we want to make sure we have investments in transportation, that we end racial inequities, uh, that we make sure that, that women are, are protected in their homes and in their jobs, that we need to continue to make that message, speak that message and talk to people every single day. And um, I see that that is about communicating, um, not as a referendum on those values, but on how do we reach those values to people who, who and make people understand that th these are their issues as well. Throughout the campaign, Hogan and his supporters argued that progress was being made in Maryland. I mean, our response is that to me, the status quo isn't acceptable. I mean, you know, the ridiculously high murder rate we have in the largest city in Maryland, uh, the continued kind of ongoing uh, inequality like Maryland should be as well, a high income state, one of the places that have the greatest equity in the country and could be a model for that. As a resident of uh, Maryland, I've seen how Hogan's idea of a developing economy seems to leave those who are economically marginalized, it, it leaves them to continually be dis marginalized. Activist Richard Elliott argues the media often focused on personality rather than policies in the governor's race. They use such things to describe him as popular. Uh, awesome, uh, man of the people, guy you can get a drink with, the kind of ways they described George W. Bush when they don't analyze his policies or his politics, but just his personality. People should not ever vote or cover a candidate based on their personality alone. Progressives will be facing many challenges in the upcoming years. I think the biggest thing for me is um, preparing for uh, the next session is school funding. Uh, that we're up to change the school funding formula. We're looking forward to the, the Kerwin uh, Commission's report and recommendations. And we got to fight like hell. Uh, you know, I'll be, I've already started gearing up in my district and pushing this narrative that we really have to account for it. things like concentrated poverty and the need for early childhood education to be fully funded. Redistricting through the census is going to be a big issue in 2020 um, that I think we'll see some varying outcomes of that regardless. I mean, hopefully it's a nonpartisan redistricting that occurs, but you know, it hasn't really been the case in Maryland, regardless of who's been in charge, and we've seen that across the state. Another big issue that we're gonna we're gonna be faced with moving forward is judges. I mean, criminal justice reform, um, and and I've already heard from some folks who have seen some of the early lists that um, that Governor Hogan has put together, and I'm deeply concerned that these folks will really lean towards mass incarceration as a solution towards violence reduction in Baltimore City and across the state of Maryland. That's a big problem. Yeah, so a number of people here um, also noted that um, a big challenge that uh, Jealous faced within the Democratic Party was not only not like the refusal to sort of back him in an enthusiastic way, but also people are really sick of the Democrats' failure to uh, deliver on a bunch of promises that they've made. Jessel, I think, specifically talks to Mary Washington about the $15 minimum wage that Catherine Pugh promised that she would mm -hmm. um, push through and then she didn't when she was elected. Right. Um, you saw City Councilman Christopher Burnett also picking up on that piece. The other thing is um, uh, Richard Deshea Elliott, an, an advocate and political organizer, um, drilled in on something that I think we see not only locally but nationally, nationally um, which is it, it makes no sense to be talking about people's personalities when there are real issues that people should be paying attention yeah. to. And the media has to serve as the fourth estate. Like, you cannot just keep... It, it's like they were um, uh, co-signing or um, participating in Hogan's campaign, continuing to talk about how much people like him. Totally. Like, Okay, they yeah. like him and because which policy? Right. But then when people hear everyone likes Hogan, what happens? They all think, oh, everyone likes Hogan. I've talked to so many people who have said like, well, everyone seems to be okay with him. So I guess I am too, because right. I haven't heard very much coverage of his actual record. Mm -hmm. um, so many people that I know, like Facebook and in person, I like that governor. And I would say, you like what that he did? Yeah. And they couldn't tell me. Yeah, it's sad. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, though, I guess we do still live in a 
time <laughs> when you have to be a charismatic, bold leader who has like an amazing um, ability for not only rhetoric, but also like the, the ability to go and like kiss the babies afterward. And um, I think I've heard a lot of people say that, that they were disappointed in Jealous's inability to do that. But I think that that's also like, maybe he's not the most charismatic leader ever, but that's idea is reinforced when you keep on hearing media coverage that says like, oh, people don't think that Jealous is charming. People don't think that Jealous is a very good speaker. Well, I'll push on that because also when he needed to go off script, he didn't really have clear answers about what needed to happen. So it's not just that you're not charismatic. What exactly are you planning to do? And I'm going to talk to you about something over here. It's not on your script. Can you talk about it? And his inability to do that left people feeling like, well, he really can't put ideas together and be a strong leader. And I don't think it's necessarily a problem to talk about charisma if it's coupled with because people like this policy, this policy, and this policy. Mm -hmm. And we saw that really missing vastly. And, you know, I think it is a real thing. It's a human dynamic, right, to say this is somebody who I would want to follow. Sure. It appears like they have a grasp of the situation. Uh, they, I have confidence in them, right? Like they're not reading a book upside down while the World Trade Center is being attacked For by sure. um, um, two jet planes. So um, I don't think that's in isolation a problem, but the problem is where you participate in hiding the ball from the public. And, yeah. and we see that on an ongoing basis, also in the Democratic Party in Maryland, where um, the election is over and people are not really engaged in pushing and asking questions. So in this piece, when they talk about the mayor saying she would pass the $15 minimum wage and then getting into office and vetoing it, okay, and then what? What is the follow-up? That, what role does the media play in following up to help people mm-hmm. um, get information and also be able to use good information to advocate for themselves. And I think that there's also an aspect of um, you you trust somebody who, if you really believe that somebody understands their material, they should be able to present it in a way that anyone could understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that when people didn't see that from Jealous, there's, you know, I think with reason, there's a sort of assumption that, well, if you can't articulate this in a way that all of us can understand, then yeah. do you really even understand your own policies? Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of good catchphrases in there, like the tax the 1%, 1% more thing, I think sort of many different kinds of people could get behind. Mm-hmm. But then when you start to, like you're saying, when you start to unravel that a little bit and ask what that would actually look like, mm-hmm. um, there's, I think, uh, you know, not not as strong an answer. Yeah, you know, the, the biggest <clears throat> burr in my saddle is when people say fully fund education. What does that mean? Fully, yeah. <laughs> fully fund what? Like, yeah, we agree. Yeah. They should get money. Fully fund. But for what? Like, fully fund education is not in and of itself a platform. Yeah, exactly. So. And also, fully fund assumes that any current budget is enough. Right. Whereas, I think many people would say that fully funding would be something far and away. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> Or that we know for what, right? What are you saying? Um, are you talking about recruiting a diverse workforce? Are you talking about reducing um, the impact of teaching to a standardized test? Are you talking about all students having access to content that would support them participating in the future of work? I didn't hear any of of those things. Some of it was written in his platform on his website, but never heard him articulate anything beyond fully fund schools and, you know, potentially use tax revenues from sales of marijuana to fully fund schools, which in and of itself is regressive, right? The people who are, again, going to be most heavily taxed are not going to be the 1%. Right. So... It's true. You know where I did hear some of those ideas come up, though? (laughs) Um, What a beautiful transition. (laughs) Um, Was in a panel that you led um, with a number of education uh, experts and advocates from, uh, you know, around Baltimore. Yep, from the higher education community. So we had Christian Anderson and Simone Gibson from Morgan State University School of Education. We had um, uh, Rob Helfenbein, who's Associate Dean of Loyola University of Maryland School of Ed, uh, Jessica Schiller, who's from Towson School of Ed, and Eric Rice from Hopkins School of Ed. And it was an amazing discussion. Like, it was really, <clears throat> I think, and based on the comments from YouTube and Facebook, it was really accessible for people to really think about um, questions that came up like, what is the purpose 
of education if we're saying we're trying to prepare kids for education. Um, so that was an awesome point in the conversation. And then uh, we're going to check out a little clip here that talks about national progressive policies and if we saw it from anyone's campaign. Um, so let's check this out. Where are we seeing innovative stra strategies, progressive policies nationally um, that either the state of Maryland can look to, Baltimore City can look to? Are there candidates for office during this election cycle who are talking about really progressive policies that would provide access to equity across schools, right? As opposed to simply these Band-Aid approaches or you know, mm -hmm. plugging holes with our fingers, really rethinking the way schooling is done. Mm -hmm. I think it's like, you know, I mean, equity is not really on the on the national um, conversation at all. In fact, I was just reading, you know, a, a kind of a summary of Betsy DeVos's um, uh, work thus far um, and how so. It's short read. <laughs> <laughs> is it? But it's depressing. Read. But it's it depressing in that people have, you know, advocates had really have had to stem the tide on the lack of policy, right, around protections, equity for all kinds of different groups. Together, so I think we have to, I keep, my mantra tonight is we have to totally, everything that we've been doing, we just need to stop. And we need to kind of start over again because it's not preparing the students to, to face the world that, 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 that's approaching. Um, but thinking about, you know, who informs um, education reform policy, it's never people like us, it's never teachers, it's never students, it's never the people that really encounter the work daily um, that are informing that policy. Right. What should we be doing about the, the oncoming um, instanti instantiation of automation yeah. and, and, and not being in a place five but years from like, now where um, our kids are already behind because we're not having the conversation. And don't forget about artificial intelligence. Absolutely. So right. often when we think about automation, we're thinking about factory kind of, right, 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 those right, kind right, of skills. Right skilled labor jobs, right. but artificial intelligence is predicted it, where there's very few jobs that are not going to get touched mm -hmm. by this. Right. So I think it's a fair question, but, mm -hmm. and this is, um, you know, overly education scholarly, I guess, <laughs> right? But John Dewey said a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. right, that you can't have education to prepare for the future because right. you don't know what the future, future is, is. Right. right? So what you have to do is you have to have an education that prepares people for life. I was excited in this conversation to hear about um, how education will have to change um, and, you know, not even not accommodate the changing world, but really respond to it um, and equip kids to uh, function in a world that's not maybe the same as it was 10 years ago and is not the same. It will not be the same in 10 years as right. it was today. Right. Um, and you've been, I think, really interested in the future of work and how education can not only prepare people for work, but also prepare them to think and learn mm -hmm. um, in ways that are relevant. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was the point that Christian Anderson was getting to in this particular clip, right? That, you know, we don't know what schools need to be in the future, but what we know what will always be required to prepare students for life. And if we can adjust schools to do that, to support more critical thinking and problem solving, then they should be okay. But we do need to put some computer science in there. So <laughs> yeah, we definitely yeah. know that that's the case. Yep. Um, I was, I guess, disappointed, um, but not surprised to hear that all of y'all seem to agree that nobody was really, you know, putting anything forth that was sufficient. Um, I mean, what we saw in this spring and most recently uh, was a number of policies coming out of states related to, or, or a great deal of advocacy related to teacher pay. And so I think people were like, yeah, there's a movement to improve schools. No, we need to, to pay teachers um, to do the professional job that they're doing and respect their craft and support them with the type of training um, and school environments that are necessary. But that is not in any way um, a statement of what progressive policies are required for high quality schools to be accessed by all kids, right? And, right? and so I can't recall a single policy um, that was attempting to do that. We saw one state, uh, I can't recall if it was, it was somewhere in the Midwest where uh, they placed on the ballot that all all students have a right to a quality school, right? And we also saw in Detroit, Michigan, a, a lawsuit coming up about the same issue, right? That you don't just get to open um, a building up 
push a bunch of kids in there with a couple of educators and say, we've done our due diligence, mm -hmm. right? That instead, um, there is an affirmative requirement to provide quality schools for all students. So that is certainly progressive because it gives a baseline, a foundational right for uh, quality schools. But otherwise, not, you know, some of the most progressive candidates, I did not hear from them um, specific education policies that they thought would expand access. Uh, I think folks have felt that way about education and uh, across the nation. Mm -hmm. um, as we're recording right now, uh, a bunch of youth climate activists are also occupying Nancy Pelosi's office, saying that they feel sort of the same way about the kinds of climate and environmental mm -hmm. policies that are being put forth. Um, and I had the opportunity to talk to Bill McKibben about that um, on the campaign trail. He was actually campaigning for Ben Jealous here in Maryland. Um, Tell us who Bill McKibben is. So Bill McKibben is the founder of 350.org, which is a leading uh, climate environmental uh, advocacy group. Um, he wrote sort of the first book about climate change for a general audience um, in the 80s, long mm -hmm. before uh, climate change was really on the political agenda for most people. Yep. Um, and he, you know, was pretty realistic about the outcomes for um, Jealous, but I did also get to talk to him about what, you know, good policy in Maryland would look like, um, because good climate policy and good environmental policy isn't just good because it protects trees and animals. It's also good for the economy. It's good for culture. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about or what we're going to hear in the clip from that interview right now. Cool. We've made some strides in cleaning up places like Chesapeake Bay. We've made a lot of strides in cleaning up a lot of places around the country. But all of that is now coming uh, apart as the temperature warms. And as the, in the case of the oceans, not only is their temperature going up, but their pH is going down because of the carbon in the atmosphere. And these are now the really deep threats. There's no way to make Chesapeake Bay a healthy place save dealing with climate change. That's going to be the bottom line for all marine ecosystems going forward. And so uh, for places that are like Maryland, low to the water, I mean, go to Ocean City, I mean, you know, low to the water and depend on the ocean for both uh, economic value in terms of fishing, but also in terms of tourism and, and just where the ocean is a part of people's psyche, you know, part of how they identify who they are. I mean, what would Maryland be without crabs to eat, you know? Um, in that kind of world, we've got to take this super seriously. It's really time for Maryland, I think, to, to embrace the idea that civil rights and environmentalism are, are crucial parts of the future. Not something to be deferred or delayed, but to be put center stage. Yeah, it was, it was nice to hear somebody like McKibben be realistic about the possibilities for the future and also acknowledge what Hogan has done. I mean, Hogan did put billions of dollars into funding um, the restoration of the Chesapeake Bay, but what comes next now? Right. What are the steps that are going to protect the bay from ocean acidification or bay acidification in this case um, from uh, the effects of sea level rise, which could have a huge effect on a place like Baltimore? Um, so, you know, I'm yeah. excited to see what the environmental community asks for next, but mm -hmm. I think many of us are a little bit concerned about Ogun's Well, I think that people, you know, for years have been hearing clean up the bay and that it's getting better. And, you know, what I liked about what he said is like, listen, we have to pull up, right? So the bay is never going to be as healthy as it can if the rest of the climate is off kilter. A hundred percent. So it's good. Yeah. Um, our next clip is another one from Jessel Noor. Uh, this one is from an ongoing story that he's been following yep. over at Johns Hopkins Hospital. With a little plot twist in it. Yeah, with so a little let's, plot let's twist. Let's take a look. The nation's top labor board has found world-renowned Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore violated federal law by restricting the rights of nurses seeking to unionize one of the nation's top hospitals. What they've done is have us not be able to talk to our coworkers on their breaks and not give them the opportunity to hear vital information that they need to be able to make an informed decision about whether or not they should vote for a union. And the labor law is clear that that is not okay, it's against the law. The other thing that they've done is tell us that we're not allowed to talk about the union at work, but we are allowed to talk about the union at work. The decision might come as a surprise to some because under President Trump, the board has consistently ruled against unions. 
pro-union nurses and supporters staged a press conference in front of the hospital to announce the news on Wednesday, October 31st. Just feet away, nurses opposed to the union effort held a counter-demonstration. My response to the preliminary ruling is that it is just that, a preliminary ruling. It is not validation of innocence or guilt on either side of the event. It is just that, a preliminary ruling. And um, so you, th you think there's no, there's no merit to the claims? I think the largest number of people who have tried to keep the union out of the break rooms and out of their units is the nurses themselves. The hospital said in a statement, quote, we believe the union's charges lack merit and we respectfully disagree with the National Labor Relations Board's regional office preliminary decision to move this matter to the next step in the process. They have not said yet if they will fight the ruling or if they will agree to a settlement on the charges. If no settlement is made, the board will issue a formal complaint against Hopkins. Pro-union nurses also say other allegations of unfair labor practices remain under investigation. The fear is real. Management is um, definitely driving that fear into us, um, making us go to mandatory, um, essentially like union, um, anti-union educational sessions. Um, and a lot of my coworkers who previously supported the union have kind of gone into silence and won't really speak about it um, because they're scared. They're scared of losing their jobs. So this is really helpful. Yes, it is their right to organize, and I agree with that. But it's also my right to not be in a union, and it's the right of my colleagues to also not be. And if you want to come in, then tell us all of it. That's what we want for our patients. That's what we demand for our patients with informed consent. That's what we deserve. Tell us the whole story and then let people decide. Not just your all roses and balloons, because there's another side. Um, I mean, everything we put out is truthful. Um, and in fact, a lot of the uh, misinformation is coming from the hospital side. It's a very expensive, coordinated campaign to spread fear and misinformation. And we, we're nurses at Hopkins. Why would we lie about what the union could do? brings for us because we're going to be in the union. When the union, when we vote, yes, we are going to be the union. So it just doesn't make sense that we would, there's nothing for us to gain from that. The Hopkins nurses are seeking to unionize with National Nurses United, the largest nurses union in the country. National Nurses United has donated to the Real News Network in the past, most recently in 2016. We'll keep following the story. Okay, so we see a big bad institution blocking people from attempting to unionize, and then someone who would benefit from the union saying, nope, we're the ones blocking it. Yep. <laughs> we don't want it. So that's the first time. I mean, we knew there were nurses who were not down for unionizing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's our first time getting them. To actually talk on camera. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I recognized, actually, um, one of the nurses who he spoke with, one of the anti-union nurses who he spoke with from a Facebook group that, I guess I can say this, hello, we were uh, watching y'all on Facebook, hello. <laughs> um, probably Hi. none of you are actually listening to this, so it's fine. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I guess I, I get it. I know how much anti-union propaganda has been going around uh, there, and... I understand some of their concerns and some of that bootstraps mentality of like, why don't you just try to have a good relationship with management? Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. We'll you see. know, I, I'm always <laughs> interested in the co-worker anti-union perspective because it's like, it doesn't harm you to allow them to negotiate, Yeah. right? So why are you actively against them? Um, it makes me go, hey girl, hey, what's your beef? <laughs> so. We'll see how that plays out, but it was yeah. very interesting. Yeah, we'll certainly keep following that one. And speaking of uh, putting structures in place to make sure folk have access to um, the best way to support their families and uh, feed their kids and, you know, um, not be locked up for silly reasons like I can't afford the bail, even though I am charged with a misdemeanor. <clears throat> 
we were a media partner for a forum that took place here uh, hosted by the Job Opportunities Task Force and the Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition. They brought in the Insight Center who has been doing reporting led by uh, two, two economic scholars, Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton, um, really about the color of wealth, like what barriers are in place to um, expand wealth to all people, um, but also what could happen to support folk who have been historically under-resourced, locked out, um, oppressed by institutions, by individuals? What, what could we put in place to, um, I don't know about leveling the playing field, but at least give people a running start to catch up? So let's take a look and we'll come back. The Color of Wealth, Race, Wealth, and the Criminal Justice System in Baltimore Forum brought local advocates together to surface potential policy solutions to disrupt barriers to building wealth for communities who have historically experienced divestment. We were talking about the release of our report called No Exit, which looks at the debt collection system in Maryland. And what we found from our research is that, that the way we have our debt collection system in Maryland currently um, exacerbates poverty and widens the racial wealth gap in Maryland. We have a lot of policies that penalize the poor, um, but we don't have very many policies that actually help people escape a debt trap. Hosted by the Job Opportunities Task Force and Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition, data and insights were shared from a coming report by the Insight Center with research led by economists Derek Hamilton and Sandy Darity. So today's event was um, about sharing data and research from Insight Center about the color of wealth and the intersection between race, uh, the, the criminal justice system, and asset building and wealth in Baltimore City specifically. We've been working with a couple of economists for the last few years, Derek Hamilton and Sandy Darity, around looking at the dynamics of race and wealth and what it's telling us about the future of this country. And, and I think that one of the most important things we've learned is just how little wealth blacks have across all the cities that we've looked at, that they tend to have the lowest levels of wealth amongst most of the groups that we examine. You know, this is a really, really big uh, problem. It's, I think it's one of the biggest issues of our generation. And so it requires a bold approach, one that's going to really um, address the real issue, which is intergenerational wealth. That means that some fam that families have the ability to pass down wealth to the next generation. And so this idea of a young adult trust, that is seeding um, young adults with, with capital, anywhere from twenty to $60,000, could be a solution to actually deal with racial wealth inequities. We're actually going to be releasing a report in the next couple of weeks that's looking at millennial women, particularly millennial women of color and wealth. And what that's going to really show is that we're really seeing that that particularly Latinx and black women have very low levels of wealth. Black women have the lowest levels of wealth. So this take this, for example, um, women under 30 who've never who've been arrested, um, white women who've been arrested who are under 30 have more wealth than a black woman who's never been arrested, um, much more wealth. And so it's really telling us that that, you know, although people are going to college, they're working hard, um, they're doing the best for their family, that that's not enough to overcome these low levels of wealth. Participants highlighted promising solutions and practices following the morning panel. I thought it was really helpful to have the data broken down by um, by health. I thought that that was a really interesting way to think about, all right, how, what's the impact of health and our physical health and uh, on wealth and vice versa? And so that was really eye-opening to me that we've really got to figure out a way to solve this problem because otherwise our overall well-being is at risk. It's not just about having more cash so that we can do what we want to do. It's about our well-being overall. Using my own story at how um, I um, am a licensed nurse technician, um, worked at the VA for over eight years, and the minute I got that criminal record, it prohibited me from working in any hospital, any nursing home, and, and I my story is the story of thousands of women who live in Baltimore. The Baltimore is a hospital town, right? And so when you are a woman trying to like get your life back in order and trying to build wealth for you and your family, typically that is an industry that you go into. Um, but because occupational licensing in Maryland 
is a problem for individuals with criminal records because we have not figured out a way to be more innovative with making sure that people have access to occupational licensing and the laws um, are caught up to the times. Um, many people are forced to work low wage jobs or get two and three jobs um, making less than $15 an hour just to make just to make ends meet. This clip touches on um, one of the big solutions that uh, Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton have put forward, which is goes colloquially by the name Baby Bonds, mm -hmm. um, which is a really innovative concept that you know folks have been proposing, um, and uh, you know it's it's pretty incredible to see all of the different ways that these wealth disparities and you know social disparities and other economic disparities touch people's lives whether it's access to a bank access to a car access to safe housing mm -hmm. debt traps debt traps 100 um, uh, how the criminal justice system continues to put barriers in front of people you heard from Nicole Hansen talking about being credentialed to work in a hospital but because she obtained a record being locked out of jobs that are um, you know pretty high paying in the state so it, it, it is something that I think people underestimate mm -hmm. and when you think about the color of wealth um, and you see the scales right of well for every white household that has this amount of wealth black households have zero or negative yep. wealth um, having the data is very helpful right because then we get to tell the story of um, for example, the Job Opportunity Task Force has a report called the Crim Criminalization of Poverty, right? And so if you're poor and you have to go to a check cashing place, it costs more, right? And if you are poor and you have a bench warrant, you get picked up and you can't pay to get out to go to work yep. <laughs> to feed your kids, you know, it's just an endless cycle of being unable to... Um, participate in society in a way that's co contributing and then people wag their fingers at you saying if you would just pull yourself up by the bootstrap yeah this piece also um in the clip that you just heard touched on the um the way that some of these scholars are dismantling some myths about mm -hmm. um the you know like underwealth and underserved uh communities like oh if black people could just save more right stop that buying would fix jordans the, yeah like, that would mm, fix the wealth gap actually people are saving but because they don't have a safety net that comes from generations of you icing me out of owning property right. or icing me out of being able to um have affordable college then if i do lose my job it's not you know, a catastrophe. Yep. Whereas if you lose your job, you know, you'll get back on your feet in a, f a few months. So. And P.S. There's not even a bank in my neighborhood or the neighborhood next to mine or the neighborhood next to that that mm -hmm. I can use. Mm -hmm. So how am I supposed to be saving in the first place? Right. Um, but the fact is that they save at the same levels, yeah. right? And when you uh, bring back in the, the, the perspective around um, criminalization, you see that um, I think you heard from Anne, a white woman with a criminal record is more able to access particular jobs than a black woman with credentials with no record, yeah. right? And so what's your explanation for that other than racism? Mm -hmm. yeah. I spoke with Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton about a year ago now mm -hmm. um, about their research that um, looked at the impacts and causes of these wealth disparities in other places, but it's incredible to hear about the, the research on Baltimore, Baltimore. specifically. Mm -hmm. um, so again, obviously this touches on every kind of story yeah. that we do. We totally connects to Lawrence Brown's research around the black butterfly, butterfly and the white L, yeah. right? And where, res where resources and where wealth is situated in the city. 100%. So. All right, Darna, so what's gonna take us out today? Well, as we mentioned before, um, our outro music today is from Nick Breed, who was uh, murdered last month. Uh, rest in peace, please. He was actually murdered on my birthday, which is pretty mm. horrible. Um, and, uh, you know, really think lost too soon, obviously just as a human being, a young human being, mm -hmm. but also really an up and coming rapper who I think was starting to have a lot of influence. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, rest in, rest in peace, Nick Reed, and shouts to everybody who loved him or called him friend, but yeah, we all need to do more to make sure every life is valued and we're not hearing these kinds of stories. So, That's true. Shouts to Nick Reed and 
Take care, Baltimore. Take oh, care, Baltimore. Actually, let's say thank you to some folk as yes. we go out. Shout outs to Dwayne Gladden on uh, video. Stephen Frank on sound. Shout outs to David Hebden who produced this for SoundCloud for your listening pleasure um, or Stitcher or iTunes or wherever you consume your podcasts. All right, family. Peace. Peace. I got zero tolerance, respect my mind. I'm trying to fit. Granted, tried to freeze the demon with that holy water. My soul's still burning off a sin. I'm deep up in that water. No lie, I never wanted the fame. I was just trying to get it and I hit you up with the flame. Forget a law, cause I done seen it. I be coming with pain. But I feel blessed cause I have a pain. Don't you go speak on my name unless you want the opposite. Deep in the water, we're swimming. I swim to the shore, independent. I'm chasing the women, but getting my throw in the bin like a fish. And I gotta get me as a trap. I'm way out the trenches. Fell in some ditches. My niggas was turning to snitches. But I got the gimmicks to kill him. It's none of your business. You don't even know when I'm guilty. I was a kid left alone. Never know where I'd have been. I'd rather be left alone. And once you by my side again, you call me back like you home. I'd be like, come outside again. I know you mad cause I'm wrong. But baby, love it. Never know where I'd have been. You never know what I was saying. I got zero tolerance. Respect my mind. I'm trying to fit. Granted, try to freeze the demon with that holy water. My soul's still burning off a sin. I'm deep up in that water. No lie. I just speak in my conscience. Well, the way that I don't care. Feel like I'm beefing with monsters. I just never had a fist. I send results with no glove. Hope I don't bring no baby hair. House in these streets ain't no love. Though I can hear the hate so clear. Creepy and sleep ready quickly. You know I'm a beast with that ruby. You know I do. You went different to bad. Pay my music. I fuck it just like I'm a mutant. She say I'm a mutant. She think that she got here with Cupid. I told her she geek and she stupid. Yeah. She think that she got here with Cupid. I told her she geek and she stupid. She know I was a kid left alone. Never know where I'd be. I'd rather be left alone. And once you by my side again, you call me back like you home. I'd be like, come outside again. I know you mad cause I'm wrong. But baby, love you. Never know where I'd have been. You never know what I was in. I got zero tolerance. Respect my mind. I'm trying to vent. Granted, try to freeze the demon with that holy water. My soul's still burning off a sin. I'm deep up in that water. No lie. I was a kid left alone. Never know where I'd have been. I'd rather be left alone. And once you by my side again, you call me back like you home. I'ma be like, come outside again. I know you mad cause I'm wrong, but baby. Never know where I'd have been. You never know what I was in. I got zero tolerance. Respect my mind. I'm trying to vent. Granted, try to freeze the demon with that holy water. My soul's still burning off a sin. I'm deep up in that water.